some instincts that we had in the real world are not working in the digital world. And we need to learn to, to overcome our uh, initial negative reactions towards people with different opinions and argue and discuss and integrate and interact with different others rather than close ourselves in, in homogenous communities. And I think the future of our society depends on that. In studying human sociality, I'm using the ever-growing uh, amount of data on human social interactions that now exist in, in a written form from online discussions. It's a treasure trove of data that I'm using. Um, I'm using a combination of natural language processing and uh, cognitive modeling to try to understand this data and to try to understand human sociality in, uh, in re both in real, if you wish, offline and the digital world. So all of my work does have a, some applied component and it always looks at how can we, what does this, what does this, this abstract theory has to do with human, you know, human condition? How can we help people in the real world? I'm interested in, in human sociality and how people change beliefs over time and how they influence each other. An ideal source of data would be that I you know, follow you around, you and your friends, and try to get at any given point, uh, what do you think about different issues and how you communicate with each other and how you change your mind, you know, from minute to minute, from hour to hour. And in offline world, this is practically impossible, right? And so the classical methods of social science are surveys that you can do if you're lucky, you know, once a month or once a year that are very expensive, that just provide a snapshot of the population in a given time, or controlled laboratory experiments where I put you and your friends, you know, around the table, and then I give you some more or less artificial task, and then I, I observe how you behave. But that's, it's very unclear how much that relates to how we influence each other in the real world. And online, the digital world is becoming a part of our real world. This is where many of us spend a lot of our time in everyday life. And so it's becoming, it's not just a quirk or some interesting data set that doesn't have anything to do with real life. This is real life. And it has the advantage for social scientists like me that it's written. Everything is written down. So I can actually now follow at least partially you <laughs> around the internet and see what you and your friends think about the issue and how you change your mind. And then I can apply my cognitive models, my theories to try to predict what I observe in the data and, and then use the data to inform my theories. So it's a, it's a treasure trove of data that has never existed before and that's, how I, that's why I'm drawn to it. So in general, I'm interested in um, uh, causes and consequences of the diversity of opinions expressed in different online uh, discussion forums. And lately, I started to analyze using natural language processing online discussions that occur on various news sites here in the US. So there are many news sites at all ends of political spectrum, you know, from Breitbart to Daily Kos or Washington Post and Atlantic or more middle. And um, it is possible now to download all of these comments and to, uh, to analyze the diversity of comments over time. Um, and um, the, the, beauty of the, the beauty of this data is that all of the users are anonymous. Nobody's identity can be recognized. But at the same time, people need to register for these discussions. So I can track the identity of a person. I can, I can track comments that a, 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 an individual has made, you know, sometimes over years and over many different discussions. And this is fantastic. It's exactly the kind of data that I need as a social scientist to see how people change their beliefs over time and how they're influenced by others. So I can track what the individual is saying over time and how he's influenced by all the discussions that, that he or she participates in over time and how he or she is influenced also by external events, you know, statements from different politicians or news um, events and so on. And so um, I'm hoping, okay, back to the society, I'm hoping that um, by understanding when the comments become more or less diverse, and when the society, when the society has the tendency to, to close themselves in and to become more cohesive and to promote only as one point of view, versus when it has a tendency to become more diverse, that maybe I'll, I'll be able to say something to the society, to, to tell them, look, we are now in the phase where 
where we are very cohesive, and this is because these are these factors. And we as a society can choose to either ignore these factors or, or we can choose to intervene in some way to make us more diverse if we wish to. So it's kind of basically just understanding better this whole process. I'm hoping that it can help society develop in a, in a more democratic, more tolerant society, a society that uses the digital world for its advantage rather than for its doom. <laughs> I also do kind of these experiments that I criticized before, where in controlled conditions, groups of people are solving different problems. The, these experiments are good because we can, we can try to isolate certain characteristics of tasks or groups that we think will affect group performance and diversity. For instance, we can give groups tasks of different complexity, of different difficulty. We can impose on them or more or less kind of uh, threat from, a, from, a, from another group. We can um, um, incentivize uh, uh, homogeneity or diversity of ideas and then see as a result, whether the solutions that the group will come up uh, with are going to be more, more or less diverse and whether the overall performance of the group will be better or worse. So this can help us isolate some of these things. And um, we are uh, using um, online, also actually online experiments where groups of people come together and, and solve relatively artificial tasks. So this is, you know, I think it's important to have all of these combinations of methods. So both messy real world data and experiments, and very importantly, theory. I think a lot has been said about big data, and maybe big data can replace theory, but I don't think that's possible. Uh, and I think it's a very dangerous way of thinking, because theory is needed first to tell us what kind of data we need, what are the limitations of the data that we are using, and also where to look in the data, because there are so many ways a, a large data set can be analyzed, and at the end of the day, anything can be found. And using some different blind machine learning algorithms, one can find certain regularities. But there is no telling whether these regularities will persist in the next time period and how will they change depending on internal or external factors. Um, so to be able to actually predict and to intervene in the system, we really need to know the mechanisms, the cognitive and social mechanisms that are, that are, that are producing this big data. And for that, there is plenty of theory in cognitive and social sciences that can inform the way we uh, collect and analyze this big data. So I think the combination of theory, of strong theoretical perspective, may be aided with computer simulations that give us precise predictions. And then controlled experiments and analysis of data from online communities can really can help us triangulate these different aspects of human sociality. Internet is a technology that allows unprecedented opportunities for interacting with many different people, many different opinions. <clears throat> for to, to hear a different opinion, you no longer have to risk, you know, coming to a smoky bar where, you know, people who are opposing your opinion are discussing and who will maybe beat you up. You can now go to an online discussion forum and just see what other people are talking about and you can join the discussion and there is no physical harm. Um, at the same time, we see massive formation of echo chambers, of communities where people are almost exclusively surrounded by people who, who uh, reflect their own beliefs. And of course, one, one culprit are probably technologies such as uh, web filters and technologies that serve people the beliefs, opinions that, that are likely to be uh, in, in accord with their, on their, their own interests. But it seems to me that there is more, there is a strong kind of social cognitive component there, some essential aspects of human sociality. Um, and one of them is, uh, might be this instinctive emotional reaction that we have towards hearing a different point of view. Most of us, you know, when you hear, when you hear somebody talking about something that you really, really disagree with, you kind of crouch, you feel, you feel a little bit angry, you feel anxious, and you kind of, the first impulse is probably to just move away. Or, okay, if you're very angry, maybe you want to attack the person. But basically, it's, it's this impulse, I just want to go away. And this, this might have been an adaptive response before when, as I said, you, the person with opposing opinion could just, you know, can beat you up if they're, they're stronger. But these days, at this time, it's no longer adaptive. And so I think that's one component. And um, it might be that we as society need to learn how to overcome this initial impulse and actually uh, expose ourselves to diverse ideas and beliefs and learn to uh, discuss 
uh, even with people that we disagree a lot, rather than shun them or unfriend them. Because when we are unfriending people, then we are just contributing to this echo chamber phenomenon. Now, no, now we are not talking to them. If you're unfriending them, then nobody will tell them anything opposing. So we are just contributing to this, to this whole problem. So if a group is discussing something very easy, we can expect maybe um, uh, quite homogeneous ideas about it. If they're discussing something, a difficult problem, we can expect that group will, groups will um, engage in more diversity, however, in, in more diverse ideas. However, this interacts with the perceived group threat. And in, in general, intergroup conflict is, uh, seems to be a, a property of human societies from you know, the dawn. <laughs> the dawn of our species. So it was always, we always were engaging in a lot of intergroup conflict with, with other groups. And it was, uh, in, a, in a way, our current psychology is the product of, of years of selection for reacting to, to the threat of outgroup in a certain way. And it seems that a lot of research agrees that when the group is attacked, it somehow, it often helps that the group coordinates, that it's cohesive, it thinks as one and stands, you know, united uh, confronting the enemy. And this tendency is obviously, on, in a belief space, will lead to, to higher homogeneity of beliefs. So when a group perceives a threat, even if they're facing a complex task where they should consider diverse opinions, they might close themselves and become more cohesive uh, to, to be better able to deflect this real or imaginary threat. And this will hurt the performance of the group. So the group will uh, will not be able to investigate the whole range of solutions. They will zero in on one. There will be things like maybe policing of different opinions. There will be ostracism. So together, the, the task difficulty and group threat might help us predict when gr uh, real world uh, groups, including online groups, will be more or less diverse. And it also has a practical implication that if we want to make groups more diverse, online discussion groups more diverse, the, the worst thing that we can do is to attack them and to tell, to tell them, to tell a group that we disagree with or you're all idiots, we need to uh, purge you and we need to stop you from existing <laughs> because that's threat. Then they will, they will consolidate even more. So it seems that really like kind of respect for everyone, for each other as much as possible, uh, allowing everyone uh, freedom to express themselves. All of these old democratic ideas have the have confirmation in both kind of theoretical work and empirical work, empirical findings that we see from online discussions. I am very interested in <clears throat> terrorism. Well, terrorism is a very vague word and it's not, it has a political connotation. It's not really clear what we call terrorism, what, what is, we don't call terrorism. But in general, violence and violence uh, for a purpose of achieving certain political aims is very interesting to me. Uh, it seems to me that uh, this is basically an end product of perfectly normal, reasonable, adaptive social processes that at some points, maybe by chance, just spill out in violence. And um, I think here too, like in online discussions, this in-group versus out-group identity plays a big role. And while our natural reaction is to attack um, and diminish um, groups that, that we disagree with, this could actually promote more and more homoge homogenization of the group. And the more we, the more we push the group to the, to the margins of the society and the more we isolate the group, the more likely is that these processes of social influence they work within the group and they will become more and more extreme. So it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum. It's, it's, it's difficult to know how exactly to approach it. Maybe before, when most groups operated in physical space, if you push the group enough, they will eventually disperse because if there is no physical space for them to meet, oftentimes this will be a group's end. But now physical space is no longer a problem. So the group can meet from privacy of their homes online. And so the, these kind of fringe groups will persist. And it somehow becomes the same time where, we, where, we, where the society maybe does, does not want to have so much extremes, these extreme ideas, uh, by using the same strategies that we use in the real world, we are actually contributing to, to, to radicalizing them even more. To, to, we are contributing to more to, to uh, formation of online groups that become more and more extreme. So online discussions 
uh, are a treasure trove of data about human social interactions, but they also have a lot of problems. First, most obvious, not, not everyone is participating in these discussions. And people who participate are probably more convinced about their ideas, or they're in some way more extroverted, or there is something probably different for them than the people who just observe or who do not participate in discussions. So we are losing a significant part of humanity. Uh, the second uh, point is that, the second problem is that uh, many of the participants in online discussions are not even human. <laughs> And they, um, they are bots uh, who, uh, who are programmed to deliver a particular you know, range of messages in a particular frequency, or they're kind of paid by or somehow motivated to promote a certain message. And they, do not, they, they are not going to change their opinion as normal people, uh, people would. They're there with a the mission. And so uh, this is something that we need to take into account when analyzing data and making conclusions about human social interactions from online data. That said, this seems to be a new reality of human social interactions. So it's also not something to be discarded, but it's almost like we need new theories, new models to incorporate these non-human or less than human elements in, in human social interactions. They do influence people. So they are, I mean, they are there because they are employed because they, are, they appear to work. And so they are a, a, they are, um, a source of information that's, that's um, important and that we need to account for. Like we account for, you know, like we account for all other media sources or all other information that people receive. What are examples of such bots? Um, so there are some people who, uh, or there are some apparent bots who, who just send messages with uh, really uh, in, with such frequency that's almost that would be impossible for a normal person who you know sleeps and has other things to do to do, and these messages are typically kind of more homogenous, uh, shorter uh, with a particular message, uh, but they are becoming uh, maybe a few years ago they were, uh, they, 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 it was uh, perhaps more easy to identify them, but they are as as it. As the society is learning how to identify them, they are becoming more and more sophisticated. So there is no one proven way to identify who is a bot or who is a, you know, a paid troll, if you wish. Um, it's an ongoing battle. And um, I'm, I'm aware of, of several research projects and collaborations where people would come together and try to apply all the machine learning techniques and various you know, algorithms to detect the bots and trolls. But it's impossible to do it with certainty. You never know. And this is an ongoing kind of co-evolution of these detection techniques and these uh, attempts to manipulate public opinion. And this is, it's, it really, it, it annoys me as a social scientist who just want to study normal social interactions, but at the same time, the world is rapidly changing. This, if this is a part, if this is going to become a part of our social reality, then, then that, that's it. So we need to account for it. We cannot just try to exclude it from the data. We as a society now have all of these opportunities to interact, but it seems that the way we are approaching human interaction is still uh, guided by some instincts that we have from real world interaction. So we tend to shun people we disagree with. In the real world, sometimes there are costs to unfriending somebody who disagrees with you, but online it's very easy to shun. It's also kind of less costly to, to offend or to, to be aggressive to others. And all of these only emphasize, only uh, make only makes worse the problem of echo chambers because it only promotes formation of homogenous communities. To promote diversity, to actively discuss, to not unfriend, to be more tolerant, maybe that's something that we need to learn. Otherwise, the current trend seems to be towards more and more homogenous uh, societies, more within a society that barely talk to each other and that, that they are very surprised when another community does something that seems seemingly out of the blue, but if you were just paying attention, you would, you would know this was coming. In researching online discussions, were there any surprises for you recently? Um, I was surprised, so in, quite recently I was surprised that the predictions we came, my colleagues and I came up with from the real world, for instance, that threat will induce uh, stronger homogeneity of groups and uh, less diverse ideas. 
that we actually observe that in online discussions uh, and that we observe that in online discussions on both left and right parts of the spectrum. And this seems almost like a universal thing in human sociality that in times of threat, groups will come together and, and kind of have more homogenous beliefs. So that's kind of, it's almost surprising how, how much of the real world or the, or the, kind of the old real world sociality is reflected online. In spite of all the possibilities that online world offers for different forms of sociality, we still kind of show the same tendencies that we showed in old real world. That's interesting to me. It's a very fascinating thing to see how the same events are interpreted in very different ways in different communities. How, uh, how diametrically opposite can interpretations of the same political event, for instance, or other event, or scientific facts such as climate change be in different communities. And I think the main culprit for that are these homo homogenization the echo chambers that we have. Because like in the real world, like in, in many situations, the way we decide what is reasonable to believe, what is a good course of action, we oftentimes decide that by looking at other people around us. And we follow the example of people that we cherish, that we uh, consider to be authorities in a certain, that we consider to be experts, or that, that we consider to to have similar interests as us. And this is, in 99% of cases, this is a good way to choose your beliefs and to choose your behaviors, because uh, if you observe people around you in your particular environment, chances are that these people are also, in, in a way, found solutions that in your particular geographical area work. And also it enables you to fit with your group, which is very important to people. People are very social. So by fitting in your group, you'll have better you know, not only psychological outcomes, but better chances to find a mate, you know, <laughs> have higher fitness overall. So all of this, all of this is good. But then it, it backfires when in this very isolated online communities, there is only one opinion that's prevalent and where uh, sources from outside of the group are disparaged. And when occasionally a, a belief that is not scientific or that's even harmful in the long term for the group takes hold, but there is no one to, to oppose it. And people are using the same heuristic they're using in all of their life. They're following people who they trust, who seem to have similar interests, who they like, who they perceive experts. But now these are only confined to their own group. And, and, if, and when, the, when the belief is potentially harmful, then it can be dangerous. And I, I don't have a solution for this, but it seems that it all comes back to we really, as a society, need to learn how to promote diversity of ideas. And, and we see that kind of homogeneity and, and um, inability to accept scientifically valid ideas in, at all levels of political spectrum, all sides of political spectrum. We see it you know, in uh, people who are, who are opposing, for instance, genetically modified organisms, which in most cases, most scientists agree that they do not have adverse consequences for health, that they could help um, curb the food crisis. But, uh, or, uh, or for instance, the, the example of vaccination, where everybody, all scientists will agree that vaccination is good and that people should do that. But in certain communities, which are maybe more on the left part of the spectrum, you have strong um, belief that the scientific facts are not true, that there is something hidden, um, and that and there, there is a tendency to follow local experts, experts that are cherished in that community. At the same time, on, on some other parts of the spectrum, maybe on the right side, you have skepticism towards the whole idea of global warming, and climate change, and what we as a society should do about this. So these are some kind of problems. These are problems for the society where these bubbles form and where people are following perfectly okay rules. But in this particular social environment, it's so homogenous, this can sometimes backfire. Conformism or the tendency to follow majority can help uh, helps human societies to both learn good ideas, but also to to propagate any kind of idea. Basically, the, 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 uh, even bad ideas can spread by the same mechanisms that most of the time spread good ideas. So for us as a society, uh, in, the, in the, the circumstances where conformism can become very strong because everybody is very similar to us, it can happen that some very bad ideas take hold of large parts of the population and that we just make a mistake that might cost lives or must, might 
put us back, you know, years, years back. For instance, if everybody stops vaccinating their children or if the society doesn't do anything about climate change, this can have dire consequences. The social influence is very, very strong because the, what are the costs of believing a wrong thing? For many things, uh, including, you know, climate change or um, the, the benefits of GM crops, for many of us, it doesn't matter. If you believe a wrong thing, uh, nothing will happen to us. But uh, so, cogn so the, 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 the cognitive cost is low, but the, cost, the social cost can be very high. So if I suddenly go here at the Santa Fe Institute and propagate a new belief that I acquire that, that climate change is actually not happening and it's all a Chinese hoax, I'll be shunned. You know, people will really think that I'm crazy or something. And so I will lose the social capital, which is very, very important to me. And so, and this is what we see is happening also when we try to communicate scientific facts. Scientific, so we can design the, the information display in a, in a really nice, transparent, understandable way. But still, if you don't pay attention to what friends are thinking of the person we are trying to communicate to, then we will not achieve the, we will not achieve the, the desired effect. And so we see in, in some of our experiments that when we communicate information to people, that people who are, who are surrounded by friends who they perceive believe a particular thing, they are less likely. They are, so the more homogeneous the social environment is of a particular person, the less likely is that the person will change their mind. And even if they change their mind, they're more likely to kind of change back quickly. So it seems that for the practical intervention, it seems that we, we need to, and I, this is still an open question, I'm not sure how exactly to do it, but the challenge is to change the opinions of friends <laughs> to be able to change the opinion of an individual mind. Okay. Or maybe the challenge is to change the opinion of the whole group kind of at a similar time rather than targeting the individual. So targeting, targeting the group, tar targeting the whole social circle in some way might be more effective than targeting just a single individual with super well-designed information. And so I'm hoping if I find ways to, you know, if I find ways to do that, some principles, then this, is, this could be something that could be used by in various educational campaigns designed to promote, um, to spread information about things that are important to people, from medicine to finance to environment, and so on. In your research of online communities, what do you see on the horizon shaping up? I have only doomsday predictions, but if we continue like this, since the society will fragment more and more, and that potentially harmful idea might, ideas might take hold of large parts of the society, and that all kinds of problems could occur, uh, that this could spill out in... Uh, so, previous maybe fringe groups are now have the chance for the first time to become, to, to become popular among the large parts of the society, and with that support, actions that were previously somehow curbed because most of the society did not believe or did not support them, now can, and also, also with just general growth of population, now can become popular enough, have enough support to spill in the streets, to spill in the real life. And then you can have violence, you can have problems with diseases because of a lack of vaccination, you can have problems with uh, food shortages because of oppose, opposition to to uh, controlling the climate change or to allowing for GM crops in poor areas of the world. Currently, I think we are quite doomed. I, I don't think it's going well. It seems that there should be some mechanisms for, for um, kind of um, more interaction, more diversity. In the future, a, a civic duty of all of us will not be just to vote and pay taxes but also to actively work on breaking each other's bubbles and to, to not allow the formation of extreme echo chambers where people are only exposed to, to, to beliefs similar to theirs, but to act actively socialize online with people with, diverse, with, with, diver with different opinions and to introduce new opinions in these closed communities. Because you know, even, very, very, even the simplest models of belief spread models from statistical physics or some simple models that I do, computational models of belief spread. For a belief to spread, there must be a, 
a different belief. If there is no different belief, it's not going to spread. So a community that's never exposed to a different opinion, as it's sometimes as it's happening now in the society, some communities completely enclosed in a particular point of view, they're never going to believe a scientific fact. Somebody needs to go there and tell them. And it's not enough anymore to, to propagate the scientific facts in like mainstream media or you know, on your personal blog. Nobody will read that. People who disagree with you are, are not there. They are not believing the, most of the media that you're following. It's very important to go where these people are, and now it's more easier than ever to do that. There are these online spaces where it's safe, it's fine to go there and try to, 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 disper to, to promote an, a different point of view that, that one believes in. In your view, whose duty is it to promote diversity of opinion? So I think it's a primarily, I think we need to learn as citizens that we have this duty, that we should actually uh, uh, overcome our initial negative reaction towards people who think, who think differently and actively go and visit people in their communities who we disagree with and try to, in a, in a respectful, tolerant way, communicate a different opinion. And maybe, they will, maybe the person that we, we discuss with will not change their mind, very likely actually. But just a, a, a presence of a different opinion is better than no different opinions whatsoever. Uh, a single opposing idea has a chance to spread and influence at least some part of that community. Versus if there is no opposing idea, it's, 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 it's doomed, it's over. There is, it, it's going to become more and more homogenous. It's more courage and also the willingness to exit uh, their comfort zone. Uh, so, uh, we all love to surround each other by people who agree with us and who think that our ideas are good, who are friendly. This is, of course, it's, it's a perfectly normal adaptive tendency. But it seems that these new environments that we are now, these new online environments, the digital world, <laughs> um, will, will force us in a way, if we want to survive as a society, to learn new ways of, um, of, of, of discussing, of socializing. I, Perhaps I, you know, I believe in climate change, but if I if I am honest about promoting diversity, then there will be also more people coming to discussion forums that I frequent, telling me that climate change is bogus, and that it's all invented by the Chinese or whatever. But uh, that's okay, because if if we discuss, then I can, you know, in a respectful way, I can provide my arguments. This person can provide their arguments. And we need to go over this initial animosity and and and. Uh, separating ourselves in different groups and never kind of immediately disparaging everything that comes from a different group. You know, we need to learn this tolerant way of civic discourse uh, in which we, we try to persuade each other not by slamming each other aggressively and offending each other, but by arguments. And I let the best arguments, let the best arguments win. I really believe that, I have repeated that many times, but really that we as a society need to learn new ways to, to interact with each other and to, that some instincts that we had in the real world are not working in the digital world. And we need to learn to, to overcome our uh, initial negative reactions towards people with different opinions and argue and discuss and integrate and interact with different others rather than close ourselves in, in homogenous communities. And I think the future of our society depends on that.